morning, Zhang Wei. Good evening, Jennifer. Hi, I'm Zhang Wei, and I'm a clinician scientist in obstetrics and gynecology and IVF specialist. And my research focus is actually on unraveling the biology of ovarian follicular genesis to change the irrevocability of reproductive aging in women uh, so that we could understand how reproductive longevity can be happening and enhance the health span by means of rejuvenation of ovarian follicles. Welcome to the fifth episode of Making Reproductive Longevity a Reality. Uh, I'm Jennifer Garrison. Um, I'm a faculty member at the Buck Institute in California, and I'm the faculty director for the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. And the consortium is really trying to build the ecosystem around female reproductive health and equality. And we do that through fostering collaboration and dialogue between scientists, clinicians like Zhang Wei, funders and industry partners, um, advocates like some of you. And this webinar series is really designed to highlight some of the research that we've recently funded. So today we've got two really great talks from GCRLE grantees on some exciting topics related to female reproductive aging, uh, namely alternative splicing and cellular senescence. So when I talk about female reproductive aging, uh, most people, they almost always think about fertility, Zhang Wei. Um, but obviously we're also talking about menopause. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, over to you. <laughs> Right. I mean, many ladies have been asking me, um, especially those who are in midlife, I would say, I mean, they're still quite young. I mean, 45 and 46, and they're asking me, you know, I don't really feel that old, but I heard that menopause is really bad. You know, is there anything that I just start taking now or something I can do, you know, to, to see if I could stay young? I mean, why do I need to go through menopause? So then ask, you know, and, and, and I think I'm, I'm at this juncture where I really don't know much about it yet. And, and unfortunately, you know, this, this thing about the ovaries just decided to be uh, getting older than the rest of her body seems to get in the way. And, and there I have my other colleague here from Yale University and uh, Amanda, who is going to give us the first talk. Uh, Amanda is an assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the Yale School of Medicine and also a productive endocrinology and infertility physician scientist. And Amanda's current research program focuses on novel drivers of ovarian aging, and she is the PI of an NIH NCHD funded R01, which was scored at the first percentile, uh, and was the recipient of the 2020 Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality Junior Scholar Award. So today her talk will be focusing on ovarian senescence and what are the novel drivers of human reproductive aging. So please, Amanda, enlighten us. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, give me just one moment to pull my slides up. So good afternoon, uh, good evening, and good morning to our global audience here today. Uh, my name is Amanda Callen. I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology at the Yale School of Medicine. Um, thank you so much for the Buck, to the Buck Institute's Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality, the BioEcho Foundation, and the National University of Singapore for the generous invitation to speak today. Um, it is an honor to present this work to you entitled Targeting Senescent Cells to Delay Ovarian Aging. I have no disclosures to report. I'm gonna start first with some background information uh, for those in the audience who may be less familiar with the concept of ovarian aging specifically. The term ovarian reserve is a commonly used term which refers to a woman's lifetime supply of eggs or oocytes. Unlike for men, when a woman is born, her ovaries will contain her entire lifetime supply of eggs. These are continually lost through her reproductive life until the woman reaches menopause, the point when the ovarian reserve is depleted. For many women, this process happens over the course of a quote unquote normal reproductive lifespan meaning the ovaries are depleted of eggs around age 51 or 52. Uh, but some women go through menopause much earlier, even in their teens or 20s. And I'm sure the clinicians here can attest to the fact that we do see women um, you know, as young as 12 or 13 who have already gone through menopause. To put some numbers to this process, at five to six months of gestation, the human ovary establishes several million non-growing follicles this is followed by a progressive decline to about one to two million follicles at birth. And as you can see by menarche, this number has dropped below one million. And at menopause, there are only approximately a thousand follicles remaining. The oocytes which remain in the ovary, which have been there through the entire reproductive lifespan, are vulnerable to DNA damage. 
leading to increasing numbers of abnormal oocytes with age. This progressive decline in ovarian reserve is, is attributable to a progressive and relentless loss of follicles. Although there are only about 450 follicles, which actually mature and reach ovulation in the normal human reproductive lifespan, the number of follicles lost over the lifespan is orders of magnitude higher than that. This is because each month, a cohort of growing follicles that you can see here is continuously recruited from this large pool of dormant primordial follicles. And this is a pool which reflects the ovarian reserve right here. Um, once recruited, these follicles undergo further selection uh, processes, kind of liken them to runners in a race with runners dropping out at each stage of the race. And most of these recruited follicles are really destined for atresia. This results in continuous depletion of the follicle pool and ultimately menopause. Taken together, this decreasing number of follicles with age and increasing damage to remaining oocytes leads to a decreasing fertility and increasing miscarriage rate with age. And you can see here how dramatically these processes accelerate in a woman's late 30s. Compounding these problems is that the mean maternal age at first birth is rising. This is a chart showing the average age of moms at first birth in the 1970s, which are the black diamonds, the, 19, uh, the year 1995, which are the white diamonds here, and in 2017, the blue bars here. And you can see that in almost every country surveyed in this report, with the exception of a couple over here, women are waiting longer to have their first child. The twin clinical problems of infertility and menopause, including early menopause, bring to light a key question, which is can you manipulate the rate of ovarian aging to treat or even prevent these problems? Before discussion, discussing this question further, I'll shift focus a bit to talk more about aging generally. Within the conceptual framework of aging research, there are nine processes, processes which are considered hallmarks of aging um, in mammalian species specifically. These nine hallmarks include mitochondrial dysfunction, genomic instability, epigenetic alterations, and cellular senescence among others. I have a particular interest in cellular senescence for reasons I'll outline in the rest of my talk. Cellular senescence is a cellular response to injury, which classically is thought to result in permanent cell cycle arrest, although there is increasing debate about whether senescence may in fact be reversible. Cells which enter a temporary growth arrest phase due to exposure to injury can be cleared by processes in the body designed to remove cells, uh, including apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. They may also enter a state of cellular senescence, as you can see here. There is evidence that increased accumulation of senescent cells with aging can reflect either an increase in the rate of generation of these cells or a decrease in their rate of clearance, for example, as a consequence of an aging immune system. Senescence can be both beneficial and detrimental. For example, senescent cells can promote wound healing by secretion of regenerative factors. They can suppress tumor growth by blocking cell cycle progression, and they can guide embryonic tissue regeneration, development, and placental formation. However, senescent cells can also promote pro-inflammatory states, support tumor development, and damage tissue architecture. It has been proposed that in young organisms, cellular senescence may play more of a beneficial role in ridding tissues of damaged and potentially tumorigenic cells, but in old organisms, damage and deficient clearance of senescent cells um, can result in their accumulation and contribute to tissue aging. From a clinical standpoint, cellular senescence is associated with multiple human disorders, as you can see here, I'll read them all for you. Um, and clearance of senescent cells has been studied in multiple systems as a targeted therapeutic approach to slow aging. For example, genetic approaches to inactivate the senescence pathways or to ablate senescent cells in mouse models has shown a mostly beneficial impact in conditions as varied as diabetes, cataracts, kidney dysfunction, heart and lung disease, and neurological disorders. 
and clinical trials involving chemotherapies, which are designed to clear senescent cells, are in progress. However, one system, which is vastly understudied with respect to age-related cell cellular senescence, is the reproductive system. One approach which has allowed for investigation of the effect of senescent cell clearance on aging has been the use of a transgenic mouse model, which can selectively clear senescent cells. The ink attack mouse contains a P16 fusion protein bound to a caspase protein. Activation, activation of the caspase protein results in cell death in cells containing P16. This construct, this construct allows for drug-inducible elimination of senescent cells at, at various time points throughout the reproductive lifespan or throughout the lifespan in general by administering a drug which activates the P16 caspase linked fusion protein and effectively kills off senescent cells. Some of the most exciting work using this mouse has come from the Van Dersen Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Dr. Van Dersen's lab genetically engineered the ink attack mouse and used it to study the effect of senescent cell clearance on overall survival and on the incidence of conditions associated with aging. Shown here is work from their 2016 Nature paper in which they performed bi-weekly clearance of senescent cells from 12 months to the time of natural death. The bottom row shows the change in lifespan in mice in whom senescent cells were cleared. These are the dashed lines here. As compared to mice without senescent cells cleared, which are the solid lines, and also as compared to non-transgenic C57 mice. The increase in lifespan ranged from 17% to as high as 35% after senescent cell clearance, prompting the headline that destroying worn out cells makes mice live longer. An important point is that not only did the mice exhibit longer survival, but their survival was healthier. You can see here that after clearance of senescent cells, mice had longer cancer-free survival up to 25% than mice that did not undergo senescent cell clearance. Again, the dashed line is treated mice versus untreated mice. This is a mixed background and this is a black six background, but results consistent in both. The uh, pictures on the right show that phenotypically, the treated mice look younger. They have healthier looking skin, healthier looking hair. Uh, they have higher body weight than their um, equally aged but non-treated counterparts. As far as tissue-specific P16 expression, the group found that P16 uh, containing senescent cells were found and the cells were cleared in muscle, eye, kidney, heart, spleen, and lung. But reproductive tissues were not evaluated and the reproductive lifespan was not investigated. So for me, as an ovarian biologist reading this very exciting work, uh, my question is, are senescent cells present in the ovary? And if so, what are the effects on their, of their clearance on reproductive lifespan? There's extensive literature on P16 expression in ovarian cancer cells, but really very little literature characterizing P16 expression in the normal ovary. Uh, in 2003, Kutluk Octase group published work demonstrating that P16 is detectable in the various cell types of the mouse ovary with differing expression levels based on cell type and stage of maturity. Specifically, the group found that P16 staining was stronger in the oocytes of all primordial follicles compared to primary and more mature follicles. I haven't shown too many of the actual pictures here because the um, manuscript's about 20 years old, so they didn't quite come out in the presentation. Um, but you can see here demonstration of P16 staining uh, we've got quantification of P16, P16 staining in granulosa cells, oocytes, as well as theca cells. And on the right, I've included a pictorial representation of the paper's finding, demonstrating how P16 staining decreased with increasing follicle maturity. In other words, the decrease in P16 staining coincides with the first evidence of follicle and oocyte growth. More recently, a 2018 paper showed that P16 staining increases in seven to eight week old mouse follicles after consecutive superovulations. And you can see that in the top panel here. Um, this is the staining, five, 10, and 15 superovulations. These are normal ovarian aging mice, 40 week old mice. These are controls, and this is quantification of the staining here. 
Um, on the bottom here, you can see Western blot of whole ovaries, again, confirming increasing P16 with consecutive superovulations, high P16 in aged ovaries and uh, consistent clonification. What's interesting here is that even though the goal of this paper was not to characterize P16 in normal ovary, there's clearly P16 expression in these, uh, what I would call preantral antral stage follicles and heavy P16 staining throughout the ovary in the positive control group of these aged mice. This work suggests that senescent cells are not only present in ovarian follicles, but that P16 staining may increase in follicles with natural aging, as well as with ovarian stimulation. Thus, while a very um, limited set of preliminary data suggests a potential role for cell cellular senescence in the ovarian aging process, the contribution of senescent cells to the natural process of aging in the ovary hasn't really been determined. And specifically, it's not clear whether a critical accumulation of senescent cells in the ovary is supportive of or detrimental to ovarian function. Thus, the goal of our work is twofold. First, we are utilizing the P16 clearing ink attack mouse model I described before to investigate the role of senescent cells and the effect of their clearance on ovarian aging. We are achieving this through timed P16 clearance at various time points throughout the mouse lifespan, followed by analysis of injected and uninjected cohorts for endogenous ovarian P16 expression, features of senescence, ovarian follicle counts, and fertility. While I have focused on P16 as a senescence biomarker, because P16 accumulates in senescent cells and is sufficient to establish and maintain senescence-associated growth or rest. One limitation is that P16 um, uh, is sometimes considered to be nonspecific. It's expressed also by tumor cells. Thus, at present, the identification of senescent cells relies on a combination of multiple markers that, when present simultaneously, can discriminate between stably arrested senescent cells and their non-senescent counterparts. This includes the accumulation of a lysosomal enzyme termed senescence-associated beta-galactosidase, which is detectable by staining, as well as the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, which includes pro-inflammatory cytokines. We're going to use a combination of senescence markers as outlined here for our ink attack studies. The second goal of our work is to utilize spatial transcriptomics to create a comprehensive cellular atlas of ovarian aging. As I've outlined, the ovary contains a heterogeneous population of cell types which critically contribute to follicular survival, including granulosa cells, theca cells, and oocytes, all of which exist at various stages of differentiation and in a defined architectural pattern in the ovary. Thus, we are utilizing human ovarian tissue to create a benchmark data set which will allow us to visualize at the single cell level in situ changes in gene activity across the aging spectrum. This approach will also allow us to characterize in human ovarian tissue senescence phenotypes which can be highly heterogeneous as I reviewed and may differ depending on the cell type under study. To our knowledge, spatial profiling of gene expression has not been performed in normally aging um, human ovarian tissue, although this profiling has been used in ovarian cancer tissues. And I show here just for interest an example of the data this approach can generate, where you can really visualize the tissue architecture and identify structural patterns in gene expression that change um, among different sections of an ovary. So to wrap up, um, it is our goal to characterize senescent cells in the ovary and investigate their role in reproductive longevity. I think it's possible that we're going to find that, that um, consistent with Van Dersen's work and based on data showing increased P16 expression in the aging ovary, we'll find that clearance of P16 expressing cells delays the progression of ovarian aging. However, it is possible that as Octase group suggested, senescent cells in the young ovary may serve as a protective mechanism, maintaining quiescence of primordial follicles. And we may find that initiation of clearance of senescent cells actually accelerates rather than slows ovarian aging. Perhaps as in other tissues, we will find that 
Senescence in the ovary can be beneficial or detrimental depending on the context. Regardless, we expect our findings to illuminate how senescent cells can function to promote follicular quiescence and aging and to provide us with an important window into the role of senescent cells in the human aging process. With that, I thank you for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions at the end of our session. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, that was wonderful. Um, just as a reminder, we're gonna have a discussion at the end with both speakers. And so if you have questions for Amanda or for Arjuman, please put them in the Q&A box and we will ask them at the end. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Arjuman Ghazi. So she is a pilot award grantee from the GCRLE. She's also an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And she loves studying uh, genes that mediate the dialogue between reproductive function and aging. Um, in fact, she's been studying this for quite some time. So she did her uh, postdoc in Cynthia Kenyon's lab at UCSF. And her postdoctoral work was really um, centered around uh, identifying genes that alter longevity based on signals that come from the reproductive system. And she also helped establish paradigms to understand their function. So since she started her lab at the University of Pittsburgh in 2011, um, the Ghazi lab has um, discovered that there are pro-longevity genes which coordinate fat production and breakdown to extend lifespan. And recently, uh, she discovered a pro-longevity factor called TCER1, which I think she's going to tell us about, that has opposite effects on health span versus lifespan. Um, and when I say health span, I mean the number of years that someone is healthy. Um, which is really fascinating because that means that the length of life and the quality of life can be separated genetically. Um, and today she's going to tell us about how TCER1 shapes gene splicing in order to retain reproductive fitness. So welcome, Arjuman. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for the kind introduction. I'm, I'm super excited to be presenting at this forum today. Um, okay, there. So my lab is particularly interested in genes that define the relationship between the reproductive system and aging. And um, we think that these are arguably two of the most important aspects of any animal's life history. And I think of them as you know, the ticking clocks of youth and fertility. And while it is very well established that increasing age reduces fertility, especially in mammalian females, we actually know very little about the molecular basis of this decline and why it is so precipitous and so early in life. We also know very little about how the reproductive status of an animal influences its aging. While it was traditionally believed that reproduction and longevity are antagonistic to each other and this led to the proponents of uh, several um, age theories of aging it has become increasingly clear both from lab work as well as clinical study especially in the last 10 15 years that the reproductive fitness of an animal is very strongly linked to its overall health and longevity and we study the genes that underlie these links and we do this in a small uh, nematode worm called Sinoraptitis elegans, which has which offers some really remarkable advantages for aging biologists. So worms age like people do, as just the way you can distinguish between a young person and an old person. It's also possible to distinguish between young worms and old worms fairly easily just by looking at them, as you can see in these pictures and this becomes magnified under an electron microscope. Um, worms also display many of the anatomical, physiological, behavioral, and molecular changes that are landmarks of human aging, but they do these in very easily assayable manners. And importantly for us, worms stop reproducing at about midlife and have a long post-reproductive lifespan, just the way human females do. And many of the genes that are implicated in ovarian aging in humans have been found to regulate aging in oocytes and worms. But unlike humans, worms actually live for only two weeks. So they're really an excellent model for the kind of questions that we're interested in asking. So for my talk today, I'm going to focus on one gene that we discovered was involved in the reproduction aging dialogue. And this is a gene that codes for a protein called TSER1. So back when I was a young, enthusiastic 
postdoc, I discovered T. Sirvan as a gene that was really essential for C. elegans that don't have a germline to be able to live long. So that data is shown in this panel. And T. Sirvan was really interesting to us because it only changed lifespan based on signals from the reproductive system of the animal. So it was very specific to the reproduction aging dialogue. And in normal animals, just elevating T. Sirvan levels slightly made and made them live longer, which you can see on the right here. And this was this sort of demonstrated that T. Sirvan is indeed a pro longevity factor. So we made some really peculiar observations about T. Sirvan that led us to look at its role in reproductive health. But before I show you those data, I want to remind you that one of the dogmas in the aging field for a long time has been that long life and stress resistance are, they go hand in hand. They're very pos strongly positively correlated. And pro-longevity genes often enhance stress resistance. So we were very surprised to discover that T7 was actually, it appeared to inhibit stress resistance because T7 mutants turned out to be much more resistant to a whole host of biotic and abiotic stresses like heat stress, oxidative stress, DNA damage, what have you. And this was particularly uh, apparent when the animal was infected by a pathogen. So what you see on the right here is data of survival of C. elegans in the presence of a human opportunistic pathogen, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And you can see that the mutants survive longer than wild type animals do. And while overexpression of T. Sirvan made animals live slightly longer under normal conditions, which is the red curve here on the left hand side, overexpressing T. Sirvan actually reduced survival in the presence of pathogen. So it suggested that T. Sirvan was repressing stress resistance. Now this is important because stress resistance is an intrinsic aspect of health span, which is the you know one of the measures of healthy aging. And so we asked if T7 was actually repressing wider aspects of health span and turned out to be true. So shown here is data from a C. elegans strain that expresses the A-beta protein, which is involved in Alzheimer's uh, disease. And in C. elegans, the A-beta protein undergoes aggregation, and as a result of which the animals become very rapidly paralyzed. And the trajectory of that is shown in the black curve here. And as you can see, when these animals carry a T7 mutation, which is the blue curve, then this paralysis is dramatically delayed. So this essentially told us two things. One, that as Jennifer said, lifespan and health span can be genetically uncoupled. And we can actually have a gene like T7, which has opposite effects on the two. And two, that T7 seemed to be this unique, I would like to say weird, you could say, gene that promotes longevity but inhibits health span. So this work is published and we did a lot of work in this area which uh, is not really, I mean, the, to my mind, the most interesting question that came out of this work is the question of why. Why does T. Sirvan repress immunity or stress resistance? And one clue to this question came from a previous data that we had where we knew that T. sirvan was really essential in normal animals for their reproductive health. So in T. sirvan mutants, T. sirvan mutants laid less, they had less number of eggs that they produced and these eggs tended to be much less healthier. And these animals also showed signs of early reproductive senescence. So they produced unfertilized eggs earlier in life and in much larger numbers. Another uh, clue for why T7 may be inhibiting immunity came from this observation that we made that T7 seemed to repress immunity only during the reproductive phase of the animal's life. So what you're seeing here is data where the survival of T7 mutants and wild type animals is being compared at different stages of their lives. Um, or in the presence of pathogen. And I hope you can see that by day six, when reproduction has ended in worms, the T7 mutants are no longer surviving longer than normal animals do. So this told us that T7 was inhibiting immunity in reproductive animals, but it did not inhibit immunity in post-reproductive animals. And this made us wonder if the immunity and fertility functions of this protein were related, which is to say that is T7 inhibiting immunity to promote fertility, to divert resources towards fertility.
And this premise is actually supported by an enormous body of evidence from both vertebrates and invertebrates, where we've seen that uh, following infection, reproductive decline is one of the earliest consequences that is seen in many species. And peak reproduction, peak fertility is often associated with reduced immunity. Um, in fact, for the longest time, it was believed that pregnancy is just an extended state of generalized immunosuppression in women. We now know that that is not the case, that pregnancy is a much more complex immunomodulatory process. Nonetheless, it is true that pregnant women tend to be much more susceptible to a whole host of diseases. So to go back to the worms, we asked if T7 was indeed inhibiting immunity to divert resources towards fertility and reproductive health. And to do this, we first actually mapped the, the dynamics of what infection does to C. elegans fertility. And that is the data you see here. So as you can see, within 12 hours of getting infected by pseudomonas, the animal undergoes a very significant and quantifiable reduction in its fertility. So what we asked is that at this time point, and this within 12 hours, there is no manifest sign of infection that the animal displays. It look, looks perfectly normal. It just shows reduced egg laying. So what we asked is that, is this reduction in fertility still the same if the animal is making high levels of T cell 1? Or do you get some protection from this fertility loss? And what we found is that animals that overexpress T cell 1, either in individual somatic tissues, which you can see on the top here, or in the normal places where T cell 1 is expressed using its endogenous promoter, in both cases, the while normal animals underwent almost an 80% loss in their fertility, the fertility reduction was much less in, in the T cell 1 overexpressing animals. And this suggested that elevating T cell 1 levels preserves at least partially some of the fertility loss that is caused by infection. So overall, what these studies have told us is that T7 is this unique protein that, that coordinates the fertility and the reproductive health of the animal with other aspects of its physiology, like longevity and stress resistance. And high levels of T cell 1 seem to be perceived by the animal as being licensed to start investing in reproduction. So for those of you who are not worm aficionados in the audience, why should anybody care about this weird protein from this strange nematode? And what does it mean for female human reproductive uh, longevity? And I'd like to show you two pieces of data which I think uh, illustrate that uh, why this is merit worthy. One is that we saw that in C. elegans, as animals age, T7 levels go down. And this is evident both in the body, but particularly in the germ cells. So these are the cells that are highlighted by this yellow arrow. And what we asked was, so T7's uh, homologue, a counterpart in mammals, is a protein called TCRG1. We call it TSRG1. So in collaboration with Miguel Briano Enriquez, who's also at Pitt at the Maggie Women's Research Institute, we asked a very simple question. Does the level of TSRG1 in mouse and human ovaries also show a similar trajectory? And what we found is that, so the mouse data is shown on the left and the human data is on the right. What we found is that in ovary from young mice and young human females, there is a very high level of t surge one expression. But uh, with age, there is a very significant and dramatic in decline that occurs in the oocyte. And this is really exciting because it tells us that the protein may be performing similar function in different species. Right. So another reason why we think that this conservation is merit worthy is because of a different question that we asked, which is T surge one, the worm home, the human protein is known to function as a transcription elongation and splicing factor. And I'll come to that in a minute. So what we asked is, does the worm protein also regulate the same process? Is it also regulating splicing? So just a reminder again that um, DNA, as it is being transcribed into RNA, needs to be edited and edited to remove these non-coding protein regions that are called uh, introns. And, and you also need to fuse the coding pro protein coding sequences or regions which are called exons. And this is by, done by the process of, of splicing. And these exons are modular in that in a given protein can have uh, exons included or excluded and mixed around, as a result of which you can get different proteins coming up from the same gene. This is the this is alternative splicing. 
So as you can imagine, splicing is really important for both protein production per se and also for maintaining protein diversity. And Accordingly, splicing aberrations result in all kinds of diseases and it has been implicated in all kinds of cancers. In fact, there is a lot of evidence now that as animals grow old, splicing efficiency goes down. And it has been suggested that this decline in splicing efficiency may actually cause aging. So we went back to worms and asked, is the T7 gene regulating alternative splicing and splicing per se in C. elegans? And what you see here is data comparing the RNA from normal animals, which is called wild type, and T7 mutants. And the first thing we noticed was that the T7 mutants seem to have an increased incidence of these non-coding regions of RNA called the introns. So that is the data here. And this suggests that the splicing efficiency of these animals has been compromised. And we have a lot of in vivo data that supports this that I won't go into. But we asked another question, which is that these modular exons that code for proteins, are there exons that are included or excluded in T7 mutants from proteins that doesn't happen in normal animals? So what you see here is data from that analysis and basically we ended up identifying a group of genes whose exons undergo alternative splicing differentially based on T7 activity. Okay, And when we looked at these, these, T7, uh, these genes and proteins whose alternative splicing is being regulated by T7, uh, one group of genes really stood out for us. These were, so T cell ones seem to be controlling the alternative splicing of proteins that have known roles and have been implicated in reproductive aging in other organisms. So for example, we found genes that are, uh, that are present and function in mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cell. We found genes that coded for cytoskeletal proteins, so basically proteins that provide the cytoskeletal, the structure of the cell and are important for things like moving chromosomes around and moving cargo around. And we found proteins that are responsible for repairing damaged DNA. And interestingly, all of these processes and proteins have been implicated by previous studies and other studies in being in at least implicated in maintaining oocyte quality with age in mammalian females. So this made us really excited because what this suggested is that TSIR1 and the other thing I failed to mention is that many of these genes that are regulated by T7 by alternative splicing seem to be very highly expressed in the germline of the worm, which is the structure that you see in yellow here. So this really suggested to us that T7 may be controlling the alternative splicing of proteins in the germline, particularly ones that are important for maintaining oocyte quality with age. Okay, so in the, pro in the project that is being funded by the by the GCRLE, we are basically asking, the, investigating the role of mRNA splicing in the germline in reproductive aging. And we're using a two-pronged approach to ask this question. One is um, we're using a molecular genetic approach and asking how does T7 regulate the efficiency of splicing in germ cells? And how does T7 control the alternative splicing of genes in the germline? And what roles do they have in reproductive aging? And importantly, can we manipulate these genes, T7 and its targets, can we manipulate them to, re to retard reproductive senescence and improve reproductive health in worms? The second approach is a chemical approach. Because splicing has been implicated in so many cancers, the spliceosome has become a very sort of attractive target for uh, anti-cancer drugs and chemotherapeutics. So a host of both naturally occurring compounds as well as you know synthetically derived chemicals are available that have been used to target the spliceosome and some of them are actually in clinical trials. So what we plan to do is to use these chemicals and treat worms with these chemicals either directly or feed these chemicals and ask if that influences the germline splicing of C. elegans, particularly does it influence the molecular markers of reproductive senescence that you see with age. So does, are we able to retard uh, reproductive senescence in C. elegans by using these chemical interventions? So at this point, unfortunately, we don't have any data particularly on the, the chemical uh, intervention point, but hopefully uh, watch this space. So with that, I'm going to stop uh, my presentation and acknowledge the people who did this work. So anybody whose work I talked about or um, funding agencies that gave money to support this research is all highlighted in red. Um, I'm very fortunate to be the leader of a team 
of really talented, uh, dedicated, and very, very cheerful people. So if you liked anything in my talk, the credit goes all of it to my people. If you didn't like anything, I take responsibility for it. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge the GCRLE. Uh, uh, I'm delighted to see the, that reproductive aging and reproduction and aging relationship is finally uh, acquiring center stage in the world of research. And I'm very grateful to the GCRLE, not just for supporting this project, but for shining light on something that, uh, that is that is a problem of really great public health significance and also I think is, is a fascinating biological problem. Um, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Arjumant. I can't agree. I couldn't agree more, actually. <laughs> it's a really important problem. Um, that was a beautiful talk. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, and Shangwei, did you want to start? Yes. I'm very excited by both the talks today and, and they cheered up more questions for me uh, and I hope we'll get the answer soon. Uh, so first question is to Amanda. One of our part attendees actually asked quite an interesting question, which I think uh, you will be interested to answer, is that how different are the expression of P16 in human aged ovary compared to other mam mammalian ovaries, uh, you know, which do not go into menopause? Um, am I unmuted? Okay, good. Um, it's a great question. And I, I don't think, at least um, speaking from my area of interest, which is, um, you know, patterns of follicular expression of senescence markers, um, I don't think we really know because, um, as I said, the, the, the two studies that I cited are really the only literature that I've been able to find that, that really looked at sort of follicle-specific expression patterns of P16 in the ovary. Um, so I think, you know, that's kind of, that's why I'm so interested in this is work is I think in order to, to understand how um, human over a human ovary and expression of senescence markers in human ovary is similar to and different from um, species that, you know, perhaps don't go through menopause, we first have to understand how, um, what the, what the pattern looks like. So um, it's sort of a vague answer initially because I think we don't know yet at this point, but I hope um, if there's another talk uh, at some point, perhaps next year, I'll be able to give a more defined answer. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, we'll be looking for that. And I think P16 is quite a unique marker, isn't it? Uh, I mean, Amanda, uh, in terms of, uh, it's actually one of the markers in cancer they were looking at in actually survival cancer. So yeah. I, I was also looking at P16 in, in, in some of the studies and it's really hard to know exactly which part of the, of the ovary the P16 came from. And, and what you shared about the follicles, um, you know, th there still are follicles, isn't it, um, in, in the postmenopausal ovary. But could it be that, you know, we are not picking up something or we haven't identified the cells, which are really senescent? What, what do you think about that? And I, do you yeah. mind <laughs> um, I think that's possible. And I, I think that um, that work also hasn't been done. And, and one of the, um, you know, it, um, one of the things we want to do is, is look at and compare senescence profiles in essentially the postmenopausal ovary and compare those, pro those profiles to premenopausal ovary. And, you know, we'll look at, um, and, and this, this work has already begun, um, but we will look at um, general transcript, transcriptomic patterns, but we're, we're going to focus specifically on um, expression of senescence markers. And I think that's the beauty of like a, a spatial transcript, transcriptomics approach is we can um, not only say, you know, you know, if, if I refer back to the study I showed earlier where there's an increased P16 expression in the aged mouse ovary, mm. um, maybe we'll be able to say, uh, you know, the pattern is similar in human ovary, but, but as, as you know, um, it's, it, you know, the, the ovary is so heterogeneous and what's happening in one follicle can be totally different than what's happening in the follicle next to it. And so I think right. yeah. I'm really being able to drill down on like the, the follicle and cell specific expression patterns, um, will be really exciting. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. How about um, demand? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that, that relates to um, another question, yeah. which I think could be directed for, for both of you. Um, okay. And that has to do with just how, how complicated the ovary is, right? It's yeah. complex, not just because it's composed of all these different cell types um, and structures, but it also undergoes this like dynamic and dramatic remodeling, both during mm -hmm. development and also through every single menstrual cycle, right? It's like 
it's, it's hugely different um, from one end of the cycle to the other in terms of its structure and what cell types are there and where they are and what they're doing. So I think understanding how aging is affecting all of those compartments is really important. And I think the data set that you're generating is gonna be amazingly mm -hmm. useful for the field. Um, but what I'm wondering is, uh, thinking about TSER1 <laughs> uh, and its expression in ovarian tissue, um, do we know where it is and, and which, which cell types? <laughs> it's, um, it seems to be, it's definitely present in the oocytes and the granulosa cells. We are still characterizing the other cell types. And the, the, we are very sure that the expression goes down in the oocytes. But interestingly, and I'm not certain of this, so please don't take my word for it, but it looks like the expression doesn't go down in the granulosa cells. It's maintained. But I still have to we still have to clarify that. And we're now in the process of doing a more uh, sort of cell-specific study for the protein. And maybe taking that a step further, do you know what the relevant targets are for TSER1 in the in human uh, tissue compared to worms or you know? So there was a there was a microarray study done on cell culture with TSER TSERG1 manipulation a while back. And that's about all that is known in terms of large scale targets, you know, genomic level targets. And um, if, there are specific genes that have been identified as being T surge one targets whose splicing T surge one regulates. So BCL2 is one of those. Besides that, there is not much known about there's there's really no in vivo work that has been done with this gene. In worms, we know a lot of targets, both under normal conditions and when the animal gets infected, and you know, when in other contexts where it's promoting longevity. Mm. Well Coming to the part of longevity, Ajuma, I think I was quite interested about your stress resilience. Uh, and it seems that, you know, you, you show opposite data on that. So why are you improving health span and then we're not improving stress resilience? So that is interesting. And, and that brought up a question from one of the attendees as well. Um, which aspects of innate immunity are actually inhibited by uh, TSA1? And is it the same detrimental effect observed in mammals, uh, you know, by TSA1. <laughs> okay. Uh, Whoever asked that question, I thank you. Yeah. I couldn't go into this in during the talk. So one of the advantages of C. elegans for this work is that there are the C. elegans doesn't have a dedicated immune system. There is and it doesn't, so there is no acquired immunity. It just has a very sort of basal innate immunity. There are not even de no dedicated cells, uh, no T cells, no, not even interleukins. What the animal does is that when it encounters a pathogen, it mounts this very sort of stereotypical um, and response of antibacterial proteins, which is all seems to be regulated by the same genes that regulate innate immunity all the way up to humans. So. Uh, it's a very, very simplistic system, which in some ways allows you to just look at innate immunity without the the influence of acquired immunity. So I cannot tell you uh, what uh, what branch of immunity specifically the protein is is repressing, because in C. elegans there is only one kind. Right, right. I think I think what what I was also very interested, um, maybe Amanda can chip in as well, is that. You know, we, we observe the phenomenon that uh, when someone gets pregnant, a woman gets pregnant, I always tell them, you know, you're, you're actually immunocompromised. Um, and, and you have actually shown data on humans, Ajuman, that, uh, you know, the immunity seems to be compromised when a woman gets pregnant. So how, how did that come to place using C. elegans to study that phenomenon? Because we know that the immunity system, because, you know, you're getting something that's genotypically not the same as the woman growing and, and fisting. <laughs> you know, uh, developing in you. Um, how did that come into place? You know, how, how does it prevent longevity? Because I do remember there's some studies that shows that women, and you showed that as well, that, that women who having had children in midlife actually have a longer lifespan. Is it, is it all can be explained by what you're showing us today? Uh, I'm not sure I am qualified to answer your question, but here's, Here's what I'll tell you, uh, which I, you know, sort of discovered uh, and was very sort of amazed to discover is that mm -hmm. while immunity is indeed suppressed at levels in during pregnancy, uh, immune response and especially innate immune cells are critical for every step of pregnancy, all the way from um, from um, implantation, fertilization. 
implantation thank you very much to all the way to parturition each one of those steps requires an active immune response so it's not that immunity is being generally repressed in women uh, i think beyond that i don't so c elegans obviously it is not you know it, it's not it doesn't have a uterus it, there's no placental barrier to carry through but the advantage of c elegans is that it is one of those you know it's a very rapidly growing animal so within three days the animal is laying down 300 eggs and almost all the fat that the mother has to put in the eggs is, is made in the mother's body and transported so if the animal has to make decisions about where it is going to allocate resources whether it's going to put it in reproduction or it's going to put it in maintaining its body or going to put it in fighting of infection it's easy to study in organisms like this because that transmission of resources is very apparent so you can actually visualize fat being transported from the mother's body into the egg and you can and you know work that you know I don't that's sort of related to this we've shown is that you can actually see fat being depleted as the animal gets infected as a result of infection in the mother's body so I think that is the advantage that you can study resource allocation in a very uh, easy manner in these organisms mm -hmm. the disadvantage of course is that it doesn't have a placenta so <laughs> Well, but but it's interesting enough from you know from that perspective that we're trying to understand you know how did all these things play a part and you actually look at specific mechanisms that we can now explain you know certain things that we observe as well in the human model. Jennifer, any questions for the two ladies? Yeah, lots of questions coming in. <laughs> um, uh, this is a, maybe a little bit more for Amanda, but again, you should both chime in if you if you have ideas. Um, what interventions could leverage our understanding of potential ovarian senescence pathways to promote reproductive longevity? That's quite important. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question, and um, I think that. I, I, I... I feel like this is a field that's wide open, um, and and I think though whatever interventions end up being useful will, will really depend on what the uh, what the role of senescent cells in the ovary is, uh, where they're expressed, at what time point they're expressed, and um, how clearance helps or harms reproductive longevity. And um, and I I guess I, I think of it kind of like. Um, you know, I was speaking short of a slide earlier, kind of demonstrating how um, senescent cells aren't all bad. Um, senescent cells can have, you know, beneficial and deleterious effects depending on uh, what they're doing and, um, you know, when when the senescence is occurring. Um, and so I, I think that, um, you know, I, I almost think of it as, um, the way we think of the use of hormone therapy and you know with hormone therapy there's a timing hypothesis and you know that hormone therapy introduced at age you know 20 years after menopause can be very deleterious but hormone therapy introduced you know right at the time of menopause before um atherosclerosis has really set in uh can have much different effects and i think that I suspect that we might we may find that um, clearance of senescent cells is similar. That it, that it may really be the time at which you initiate clearance that affects reproductive longevity. Um, you know, there are different um, interventions to clear senescent cells. Some are senolytics, so they you know um, actually destroying senescent cells. Some are designed to use um, utilize the immune system, target the power of the immune system to clear senescent cells. Um, some are designed to sort of neutralize the, the secretory or inflammatory phenotypes associated with senescent cells. Um, uh, as I said, there are, a couple, there are um, chemotherapeutics which are being tested in, in more cancer scenarios. So I think um, the kind of inter intervention will depend on, um, you know, the, the kind of senescent cell really um, and I think another thing that will be interesting is, um, you know, right now, I think the interventions to, to treat senescence or clear senescence are really sort of whole body, like shotgun, non-targeted approaches. Mm -hmm. um, but because we know senescent cells have some benefit, I think what will be really interesting is um, trying to get to really targeted interventions in and outside of the ovary. Um, mm -hmm. So... Um, I think it's a field that is is wide open right now, and it'll be exciting to see what uh, what's possible. 
I totally agree. And this is a, such a great example of why we need to do this basic research. There are just so many questions that we don't know the answer to, which are critical if we're going to develop, you know, therapeutics that are useful. Thinking about the, the interplay between is sort of balance between beneficial effects of senescent cells and detrimental effects. Um, there's kind of, you know, there are some kind of obvious hypotheses you know, that maybe um, the places where senescent cells might be beneficial would be where there's a lot of remodeling, right? Um, maybe like <laughs> where the follicles are erupting, for example. So do you have any guesses? Like, do you have any ideas going into this about what, what you're going to find? Or is it just a complete question? Well, I, I mean, I, I actually, I really like the um, um, Kutlagoktase paper showing, and, and I like it because it's a different way than how I've been thinking about senescence when I was looking at the, the Baker papers, um, which sort of suggested that, that you know, that, um, senescent cells are bad, um, clearing them is helpful, but the, um, the octane work that showed that, that you found the most expression of senescent cells in the primordial follicles I think it's really cool because that sort of suggests maybe there is this beneficial effect and, you know, maybe in primordial follicles, because we, you know, we don't know why two follicles, two primordial follicles side by side activate at such different times. Like this one, you know, becomes recruited, you know, when a woman is 17, but this one doesn't get recruited until she's 44. Um, so there's some clock there that we don't understand. And what I think is really cool is that, this idea that like maybe senescent cells are part of that clock and that the burden of senescent cells in this primordial follicle versus this one um, it is, is part of what drives that clock. And this is just me totally being speculative at this point, but um, that, that's kind of one of the things I think is, is cool about this kind of field. No, that's great. I mean, I think it's really exciting. Um, uh, any other questions, Zhangwei? I think I think that 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 sort of wrap up today because uh, I'm fascinated by both your work and and I think there's so much unanswered questions you know um, especially how how you know reproductive fitness come into place and then Ajima has demonstrated that one gene one protein one pathway seems to suggest a lot and a man has shown that you know senescence on its own seems to also provide some beneficial effects that you know I I'm I'm just thinking about what the potential possibilities we can do in terms of intervention for, for women. So maybe I can tell my midlife ladies that yeah, there are something upcoming. Maybe Arjuman will find some, something that will activate T31 in midlife women that you know, I can pass on to somebody. Uh, and you know, we can change the narrative once and for all, isn't it, Jennifer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that wraps it up then. Thank you both for wonderful talks. Um, I wanted to encourage everyone to join us next week. Um, we have two more speakers, Ian Cheeseman from the Whitehead Institute at MIT and Bikram Soigar Kaya from the Laird Lab at UCSF. And they're both gonna be talking about how cell division and egg cells, um, how errors there early in development might actually contribute to changes in egg quality later in life. Um, and if you have more questions, we are going to continue the discussion um, on the GCRLE chat board. So if you go to gcrle.org, um, Arjumand and Amanda hopefully will, will be answering questions there over the next few days or weeks. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you so much. And we'll see you next week. Until then, making reproductive longevity a reality. Thank you, ladies.